studio. I'm Barbara Askman, and on behalf of Art Toronto 2020 and the Corkin Gallery, I'd like to invite you uh, all to share in this experience. We're going to walk around the studio, learn a little more about what goes on behind the scenes here, uh, rather than just seeing finished work. Um, and I'm going to get up. I've got lots of work up on the studio wall and that's a way that I kind of record what it is I'm working on at the time it's happening and sometimes it's also a way for me to track what it is I'm doing. So when I started on the glass series also titled Portraits in Conversations with Empty Vessels, I initially started scanning all the figural glass work, figural meaning that they're of objects of people of guns, of hands, uh, as compared to the empty vessels that are straightforward bottles, of which I did work with too, but not in this format. Um, and we're gonna see what finally resulted from this initial investigation. I would like to focus actually on the Madonna bottle for a moment, because that's the very first bottle that I was given by dear friends, who I saw had this bottle and I was so intrigued by it. And, Part of my intrigue was based on, huh, who drinks liquor out of a Madonna bottle? You know, so there are a lot of questions that this series brought up too. Uh, why would I want to have liquor in a gun? Why would I want to have liquor in a naked man's body? Anyway, I didn't answer all those questions, but it became uh, the impetus to get moving on a project about these empty vessels. We're gonna just go this way. And I also, sorry, wanted to introduce Eric, who's behind the camera, because without Eric, none of this would be happening. Eric Waters from the Corkin Gallery. So he's handling the camera work, which is great. Uh, I wanted to go back in time a little bit to the newspaper series, because I think it's all very relevant now with what's going on in the world and what you know people are saying, fake news, real news, um, who controls the news. and. I grew up in a family that my parents read the newspaper every day, the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle, frankly. And so we grew up in an environment where you read the newspaper every day. I still try to read the newspaper every single day. So this series grew out of this daily consumption of information, uh, information uh, that grew into long strips and also grew into, I'm gonna hold this up, it also grew into large uh, composite works. Uh, and it's really about the media, it's about how we get information, and it's also about the absolute beauty of handling a newspaper, looking through the pages, seeing what attracts your eye, seeing what you wanna read, questioning things. Um, I still love newspapers. This is the format of how the long pieces are. These were tests for much longer ones, but these became kind of the format. I think it'll make it easier for Eric if I hold it up. That became the format that they were blown up to. If any of you saw the exhibition, I think 118 inches uh, long. So they were extremely large pieces. I'd like us to kind of continue on with this. And as, as you can see, I put things up on the wall. And also, you know, part of it is a reminder because I'm very productive. I like being here. I like making art. I, this is where I spend my time. So sometimes I actually, while I'm working on new work, forget about other work that I've done. We're going to stop in the print file drawer now. And I thought since this is a studio visit, uh, it's not about seeing finished pieces. It's about all these drawers and storage spaces filled with the work in progress or work that's been finished, uh, how I catalog information. And so these are some of the original Polaroids from the Dancing with Che series. Would you like me to take it out of the plastic container? Perfect that way. Okay. That's good. Um, and this is how the series began as full color Polaroids. And it grew out of thoughts, emotions of spending time in Cuba with our family. 
and thinking about how this image of Che Guevara, who's obviously a political character, uh, became like a novelty, became like a souvenir. And you can see there's a whole file here of these. So I bought a t-shirt, I bought a little kid-sized t-shirt actually, and I created these Polaroids, but at the end when I was actually creating what I call the finish series, I chose to convert them into black and white for this, although I still think the individual Polaroids are as valid and I've shown them too. But when I converted them into black and white, it really, the focus became back on his face. So my movement, me dancing, doing whatever, with this t-shirt on to music that I purchased in Havana, uh, that caused the movement in here. So each image, I'll get one more, shows how me performing for the camera is what really creates the different kind of distortions in Che's face. I found that kind of fascinating. So I control the situation through my own body. Performing for the camera has been an ongoing uh, theme for me for a long time, from the very, very earliest works. And you know what I'm just going to do? I'm just gonna shut this drawer so that Eric and I don't trip over it. Because <laughs> we had a discussion, that would be kind of bad. Okay. Oh, and Eric's getting a picture of the Che blanket. The blanket was part, uh, part of the whole project. It was entered through the gift shop, and I took all of the Che images and had them reproduced on coffee mugs and keychains and postcards, and, and I created a gift shop uh, that actually was shown at MoCA here in Toronto when it was on Queen Street, and then it traveled across Canada, this entire gift shop. That was a lot of fun. While I'm talking about performing for the camera though, I did dig up a really early piece. And I don't have a date on it, but this would be from the early 70s. And I had moved to Toronto in 1970, but I would go back and visit my family and friends in Rochester, New York continuously. I, would, I was always back there. Um, and there was a four for a quarter, I think it was four for a quarter, not even a dollar back then, booth, a photo booth, a black and white photo booth. And as you can see, the quality of the images, it's actually really quite great. They're not digital. They're actually analog images the machine produced. Um, and I found myself going to the machine and acting out. I was performing for the camera before I even really understood what feminist performing for the camera and the gaze and all of that was about. I'm sort of moving this, sorry. <laughs> but I think it's interesting to think back to this work and some of the other earliest black and white work where I instinctively and intuitively started performing for the camera. Okay, I'm gonna put that back. And then in this drawer, this is where I store some of what I have the maquettes for the Red Series. And this is a series that probably many of you are familiar with in terms of my career because it seems to be the one that garnered a huge amount of attention when I was a very young artist where again, I'm performing for the camera. I'm acting out. I have a background. I'm doing everyday kind of activities. Here I'm talking on the phone and drinking coffee. Um, so each of these was set up as a daily activity, but fully taken out of context by painting everything that I owned red. Uh, I think the psychology of the color red keeps coming into play over and over with my work. Uh, it seems to, every time I let go of red, the next series it comes right back. It seems to be a color that I have a true affinity for. Here we go, sorry, one more here. The apple banana one. Um, I mean, I won't go into the whole psychology of red. I think it's something that most people really understand that in terms of literature, in terms of the arts. Uh, these were then blown up to full life-size images. And I think that was also what people became interested in. So we used like a wrist measurement or a neck measurement and blew them up so that they were life-size images. And when I did that, that was not something that was typically 
done in photography. In fact, many people who saw the show said, well, it's not photography. And I remember thinking, huh, it is to me. I've never worried about classifications. I've never concerned myself with how you're going to categorize my work. I just do whatever it is I feel like I have to do because I have ideas and thoughts in my head that I need to figure out what these ideas and thoughts look like. This was the second series. That, um, actually, this was the series that came before. It was the type series where I typed on the Polaroid and each Polaroid has a very specific story, short story, typed out directly on the Polaroid uh, to different friends, people in my life. They weren't family members, they were more like my generation, other artists, people that you know I spent time with or had some kind of influence on me. And then these were once again also blown up into full life-size images. I'll just pull one more out. <clears throat> And you can see from the edges, these are the maquettes. These are like the prints that I would print out before or get printed for me, frankly. Uh, so I could see what I was working with. I could see the kind of detail. And they're all shot with four by five negatives off these little teeny Polaroids. So we really had no idea if this was gonna hold together, what it was gonna look like when it was blown up. There was a lot of experimentation that goes into all my work, and with this series, a lot of experimentation to get it where I want it to go. Okay, I am gonna shut this drawer, so again, we don't face plant, <laughs> <laughs> which is what we imagined ourselves doing. We're back to the glass. Okay, so I'll move this one for a second. This is a series that grew out of the initial uh, work that you saw on the wall in the black and white uh, scans of the bottles. So these would be figural bottles. Would you like me to hold one up? Sure. I know there's a lot of glare in the studio due to the lights and it's a beautiful sunny crisp day. So these are photograms made from those figural bottles. And part of the exploration was I'm interested in going in the color darkroom and seeing what happens. What happened to me was absolutely magical. I had no idea I was going to get these bursts of like, can you see them on the camera? Mm -hmm. yep. These bursts of like lightning coming out from the bottles. And I know there's scientific reasons to understand all this, but I am interested in the alchemy of how things happen. I'm also very interested in seeing things that I couldn't see unless I make it, right? Like I couldn't imagine this was gonna happen, so I had to go through the whole process of making it to be able to understand what it was I was looking for in the work and also get that big surprise of, wow, never knew that was gonna happen. That's a wonderful surprise. As you know, I'm handling these without white gloves, <laughs> so I'm trying to be extraordinarily careful I'll show you two of the, here's groupings. So this would be a grouping. And then what I'd really like to show you is the non-figural glass. So I have a box of these. I'll hold this one up because I think it is easier to see. And when we started with the uh, regular, what I'm going to call the non-figural empty glass vessels, uh, and the first print that came out, I thought, oh my god, I'm making little Mirandis, and I love Mirandi. I think, you know, he's an amazing, amazing artist. So I did create an entire body of work just with the non-figural empty vessels, too. And this whole idea of empty vessels it's like there's room to fill it up with something. I'm not sure what it is. I'm still uncertain why I became so attached and emotional about all these bottles, but I definitely felt very emotional and attached to them. Ah, here we go. Here, this is one of the oddest bottles. <laughs> is this odd? <laughs> I didn't use it. This, this whole pile here are the they're the rejects. The good bottles are stored away very securely in boxes. But I'm still fascinated with 
the fact that this was old monk. So I don't know enough about different liquors to know uh, exactly what was in here, but I just love this whole idea of the empty vessel. We're gonna wind up over here where we're seeing some of the digital versions that I then created. So we've got this one, which is a small scale version of the one that's up at the Corcoran Gallery right now, which is a much larger scale version, where I took each of the individual images and started putting them in a grid. At first it felt like category, categorizing them. Uh, but then I just really love the conversations between what was above it, what was next to it, uh, how it created its own kind of story. There was a narrative happening there. And then I went back to the scanned ones and created grids out of the scanned ones, which are very, very different than from the darkroom ones, because you don't have that kind of magical smoke coming out, but you do have a whole different kind of magic when light comes up through the bottles. Okay, can we come on over here? <clears throat> and I'm just gonna show you, because it's called Portraits in Conversation, the individual shots here, these are what I call the portraits. So each bottle, had its own portrait pretty well taken is the way I think of it, um, as opposed to conversations with one another. So you see the beautiful kind of just magic that happens when you lay these objects down. It's great because Eric's shaking his head. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> magic. It is. Uh, very exciting. This was a long three-year project. Uh, it's now completed. At some point, I would like to show a selection from the whole series. And I would like to take you one last thing to work in progress. This is all work in progress. <laughs> so these are tape transfers. And I'm going to show you one. Does that work with the light? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I use appropriated found images. I work with packing tape. There's tape on the back tape on the front so they're not sticky anymore. And then what I've been doing is weaving with them on the scanner and creating images. These are the smaller maquettes that I've been testing out. I have not tested any of them larger. I'm not sure how they'll hold up uh, in a bigger scale. But as you can see, they're all joyously colorful. Every single one of them is all about these really happy, positive colors. Is this because of the times we're living in? I have no idea, but I come here and I want to make these every single day and I'm looking for this kind of like crazy jumbled information, but having a lot of fun with this and learning a lot and growing with it. So That's great. I think we're probably ready for some questions. Should I go back to where I was? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's We're see. We're going to answer questions. Are you ready? <laughs> okay, let's see what we have. Um, I mean, you spoke a bit about this, but maybe a good question uh, to answer is, um, do you have artists uh, that you admire who have influenced this type of practice, the, um, the type of work that you're doing? Well, yeah, when I have this... The first series, we looked at on the wall, not the images, but the orientation and the hanging in a circular format. I was thinking of Annette Massinger's work, who I've always liked those little teeny images hanging from strings. I found that pretty fascinating. I've never worked like that, because my work is usually more controlled, square, whatever. Um, but I thought a lot about her work when I was doing this. I actually think more about writers. I get very inspired by books that I've read and think that, oh, if I could write a book, I'd want to write a book like this. So I think more about literature mm -hmm. than I actually do about other artists. I admire tons and tons of artists. And as I said, when I made the bottles and saw the little non-figural ones come out as Morandi, I was just like <laughs> thrilled at that too. Amazing. Um... Maybe uh, we can talk about uh, 
This might be a bit too much of a process, but how do you know when a work is complete? I mean, even with the work in progress that you're doing now, maybe you can speak about that. It's really hard. In fact, I hate completing a body of work because I feel this dread and emptiness every time I complete a body of work. And sometimes I do go back. So the tape transfers that I'm working with right now are recycled from the images on the wall right near the door that I think uh, Eric did scan over the red images there at the door. I repurposed. You know, you're reading every day about recycling and repurpose, and I thought, Maybe I'm not done with those images. Maybe I'm going to take them and I'm going to rework them. And I think at the MoMA, maybe a year ago or so, maybe it wasn't MoMA, I can't remember, but I saw Annie Albers weaving, and I love Annie Albers weaving works. And I thought, I want to weave. So took the images and just started playing with them um, to see what happens if you start weaving work. How do I know when it's done? That's a really difficult thing to determine. Sometimes it's exhaustion, like you're done. You're so tired of doing this. But there are other times, like finishing the newspaper series, I probably could have gone on for another 10 years because the process was amazing. It was all, well, and it's something that I do every day. Read the paper and I think, oh, these pages would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have one question that I think might be good to answer. But uh, what's the doll's name and what's the story behind it? <laughs> Hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> this is a rent ventriloquist uh, speaking doll, and it actually has all the gears behind it. Uh, it was given to me by very good friends in New York City who had a, a functional use for it for their son. Um, and when I got it, I just instinctively took him out of his case. I have a little yellow box there that he can sleep in, but it just looks like a tool case. And I put him out, and I thought, it's kind of nice to have this company kind of nice to have something that represents another human in the studio. You have to understand, when I come to the studio, which I do almost every single day, I'm alone. I don't share the space. I rarely ever have assistance unless I need them for a specific task. So the dummy ha sits here. He's kind of the guardian of the studio. I did try to make a body of work about him called Who's the Dummy Now? But at the end, I realized it was maybe just for me. It wasn't meant for public consumption. Yeah, I'm kind of fascinated with him. And I'm fascinated with just stuff that interests me. He interests me. OK, and I think that's it. OK, thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Corkin Gallery. Thank you, Art Toronto. Thank you, Eric, for doing such a great job. And happy Halloween. <laughs>